So it's always kind of playing this catch up when we're looking at privilege. But just because a law changes, <coughs> minds don't necessarily change. And so that's what we really kind of want to talk about today and how that privilege um, transcends into uh, the news narrative and news stories. So. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about is we're going to play a little word association. And so, you know, we're, we're all minds here that are trying to get a little bit smarter, maybe stimulate the brain to think about things we don't typically think about on our daily basis. And so we're challenging you a little bit, but don't be shy because it's word association. I'm not trying to trick you. What do you, what kind of mental health stories have you seen in the news? And you can just say them out loud. What is it, what, what kind of stories do you read recently or at all? Anything that has to do with mental health? Homelessness. Homelessness? Someone said, I think education. Anything else? Special needs? Mass shootings. Mass shootings? What's that? Drug abuse. Drug abuse. And I also heard uh, PTSD as well. And so I think that we definitely do see mental health in the news. And I think what Tila and I are going to look at it today is with mass shootings. What do you think of when you hear the word terrorism? Any association? No wrong answers. What was that? Suicide bombing. Suicide bombing? Middle East. Middle East? ISIS. ISIS? Fear culture. What's up? Fear culture. Fear culture? Male. What's that? Waco. Waco? Male. Male? 9-11. 9-11? It's a fighting tactic. Fighting tactic? Question? No, white high schoolers. Okay, oh wow. Uh, so terrorism is one of those words that I think is used in some of the news stories we see. And so the FBI defines terrorism as you know intimidating, using violent means to kind of create sort of a, I'm against this policy, I'm gonna do something, I'm going to do, commit an act against the civilian population. In this definition, do you see anything that says anything about what a person should look like if they're a terrorist, or what religion they should practice if they're a terrorist. I just want that to sort of resonate with you for just two seconds. Does it say anything about religious belief? Does it say anything about ethnicity? Does it say anything about racial characteristics? All right, but, but what I'm gonna argue, what we're gonna argue today is that news cycles, do they, do they report this word based on those things? Those categories are what feed into what we're supposed to think this word looks like. And it's ugly. I agree. I mean, anyone who's doing anything that has to do with this definition is ugly. But my argument is this. Can we, could we all make an argument that if you're going to go into a school, or God forbid you go into a shopping mall, or any public place and open fire on someone, or if you were going to fly a plane into a building, anyone that's doing that could be mentally ill. I think everyone, right, would apply to that definition. So we could argue that every single mass shooting or what's called an act of terrorism could be given the threat of mental illness, right? Also, we could argue that every mass shooting we see and read about could be given the definition of terrorism. All right, so we're learning here that we're given information that may not be accurate, and so Tila's gonna talk to you about who's providing the information. Thank you, Yep. Um, how many news sources do you guys think our news comes from? So when you're watching television, watching the nightly news, or even not just news, but the movies that you see, the books that you read, how many companies do you think own that? Any guesses? Six. Six? <laughs> One of my students right there. Uh, <laughs> I didn't tell the answer. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Um, yes, six. Ninety percent of our media comes from the big six, or these six media conglomerates. Um, and uh, Walt Disney being the one that leads the, the pack there, but ninety percent. So that's ninety percent of the publishing companies, radio stations, uh, TV, new, uh, TV networks, production companies, all of that comes from these six corporations. And I'm going to break down just to see, uh, to show you guys what they own, because as you kind of look through them, like, oh, I watched that channel, I watched a show on here, um, and see that the story where it's coming from isn't that diverse. And moreover, we're gonna look at who is in charge, who's sitting at the table. So just like we said, who was at the table when you know we wrote the Constitution, who's at the table at these networks, and what is the agenda that they're trying uh, to uh, portray? 
So if we look at Walt Disney, and again, this is just a very small sampling of Walt Disney and what they own because Walt Disney owns everything. Um, so anytime that you go see your Spider-Man movie or you tune on to Hulu to catch up from what you missed on ABC Family or you're watching ESPN, that's all coming from Walt Disney Corporation. And if we're looking at the Walt Disney Corporation, um, the CEO would be a white male. Uh, his name's Bob Iger, I think is his pronunciation. Um, and of the, uh, of the makeup of the board, the other people that they have to attend to, uh, would be seven males and four females. And usually, and in a lot of these boards that I looked at, um, the representation of a minority voice isn't really there. So the perspective that the uh, person uh, is telling a story from comes from what they can identify with, uh, what stories they've been told. Um, and so Walt Disney, and then we look at News Corporation, which we all know who owns that, another white male. Um, so if you do watch Fox News or uh, see movies from 20th Century Fox or you're watching Fox Sports or American Idol, all that's coming from this voice at News Corporation, which again is led by a, a white male perspective. Time Warner, I really like to look at Time Warner because currently Time Warner, again, has a white male as their CEO. But when I was in college, I had the privilege of actually sitting down with the CEO at that time, um, and he was a black male. And I just completely saw the shift of the television shows that were even being shown from when he resigned and stepped down to afterwards. So I don't know if you guys remember if you watched, but these were shows that I watched because I could identify with. But on the CW or the WB at that time, we had Sister Sister on, which was about two black uh, teenage girls. Uh, Smart Guy, which was about a black, uh, really obviously intelligent uh, little guy and his family. Uh, parenthood. Before the white parenthood, there was a black parenthood that was on the WB. And after that point, we saw when the CW um, emerged with CBS and Warner Brothers that all of the stories being told were usually around white teenagers. If you look at Smallville, um, Vampire Diaries, Gossip Girl, the entire narrative changed just in our entertainment. So not just looking at the news, but in the entertainment what's presented to us. Uh, NBC Universal, again, is headed by a CEO that is a white male. Um, they own Comcast, so I'm sure everybody loves Comcast. Um, but as well as NBC News, CNBC, MSNBC, all of those news corporations are coming from this perspective. Viacom might be my favorite because even though it's the, um, our music, we have diversified music channels, look where they all come from. MTV, VH1, CMT, VET, so all that diversity still comes from one company, um, even when we're looking at music. And again, we have a white male that's in charge sitting at the table at Viacom. And lastly, whoop, lastly, uh, CBS Corporation, I had a little hope when I saw the name, Leslie, being the CEO, but Leslie is indeed a white male. Um, and so again, we look at the head of these six conglomerates where most of our media messages are coming from, and they're being told from a very limited perspective. Now we're going to show you six examples of, I think maybe five examples of specific news stories that we kind of mentioned, and so some of these places are creating the stream. And so we're going to try to break down what the headlines look like, what happened at the scene, and what the motives were there. And we apologize. I know seeing the face and uh, looking at the, the awful crimes that these people committed can be emotional, but I think that our point is really shown from looking at these two um, narratives and how they're told. So I'm going to start with Christopher Harper Mercer, who is a white male. Um, it's really close to home because it was just down in Roseburg at Umpqua Community College. He left nine people dead and nine injured. And the news uh, headlines I'm going to read for you guys, um, he was said to be anti-Christian, and he asked his victims if they were Christian before he murdered them. Um, so if we even thought religion was tied to terrorism, wouldn't we call that terrorist if we were looking at um, him committing a crime against people because of their religious beliefs? And he was never called a terrorist. Um, instead, the headlines read things like this. Gun-obsessed, timid, and his mom called him baby. What we know of Chris Harper Mercer's life. Um, another headline read, no job, no life, no success. Oregon shooter said he was born bad. Also, you know, I'm going to talk about this guy. I also want you to be thinking about questions that you may want to ask us again. That have to do with any of these, we'll do our best to answer those questions more specifically. But this is Muhammad Yusuf Abdulaziz. And as you can see, he committed a crime at the military recruiting station in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He uh, killed four and wounded three, and I think also the definition of mass shooting is killing at least four people. 
And so what did the headlines read for this guy? Well, you could probably do some math in your head, but ABC News said terrorists inspired Purple Hearts were awarded. Uh, the motive was said to be religious posts found on social media. His life, he said life was short. He made reference to Allah. Allah is the Arabic word or translation for God. But you'll see a lot of times you won't read God, you'll read Allah when you're trying to get that, that headline. And then the other headlines, and this is Fox News, it's a Chattanooga terror attack, FBI Director James Coney says, and then ABC News just read terrorist inspired attack, all right? Um, then we take you to Dylan Stormroof, who um, walked into the Charleston, South Carolina, uh, predominantly historically black church, um, an Emmanuel Episcopalian Methodist church, and he was anti-black, he didn't like black people, and so he shot and killed nine of them. Um, his motive was that blacks are racist. Um, US News and World Report said Dylan Stormroof found inspiration in apartheid regimes that once posted a conundrum for many on the right. And then if we really want to talk about privilege and the way that people are even treated after, um, if they do live and they're arrested, multiple news sources claimed from MSN to the Daily News that the police, after arresting uh, Mr. Stormroof, gave him Burger King because he was hungry. So they went and got him Burger King to this murderer and gave it to him after he was being held. This one, again, is, uh, many of you know this because it's recent, you know, recency effect with perception. We remember the last story we read. This is a very recent story from 2015, uh, San Bernardino, California, just south of here. Lots of people affected by this. This is a really horrible, tragic situation. And I'm, again, as angry as you are about this, but I'm telling you, the headlines are telling a completely different story. This last guy who was in South Carolina did something horrific. But he's not being called a terrorist. He's being, they're, they're talking about different things that are wrong with his life and his upbringing. These two, their motive was known specifically as a terrorist attack. They're Muslim extremists. Um, so right away we're looking at religious belief. The headlines for CNN read, ISIS said shooters were on our side today. Um, New York Times, FBI treating the San Bernardino attack on terrorism or as a terrorism case. And the note that I, I was doing some research for this presentation and I noted that in San Bernardino, in 2016, there have been 21 homicides in the last three months. 21, okay? And three in the last 48 hours. So how many people have heard headlines about that? That's a lot of people, isn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a horrific, tragic situation. In, the, in just 2016, we haven't heard anything about it. You wanna know why? Well, we'll talk about that later. All right, go ahead. Uh, can I make a comment? Sure. This, the previous one is interesting because when it just happened, the first six hours, it said that they're looking for three white suspects. Oh, okay. And then the story was completely wiped out, and then this story came out. Yeah, I carry on for days. If we want to look specifically at skin tone, she has a very light skin tone, and so I can see how that might be confused possibly, but yes. Yeah, I don't but the narrative would change, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Tila. Uh, then lastly, uh, Adam Lanza. So we are very familiar with um, the horrific tragedy that unfolded in uh, Newtown, Connecticut, at Sandy Hook Elementary School. He uh, killed 24th graders and six adults. And the reports were detailing Adam Lanza's life before Sandy Hook, and most notably, um, like Psychology Today magazine said, was Adam Lanza an undiagnosed schizophrenic? So again, we see the mental health um, headline that is really capturing um, that story, and we're looking to see what went wrong, how he got his gun, instead of looking and calling who, you know, killed children. I would, again, argue that that's terrorism. All right, so next we're going to talk to you about really when last, or a year and a half ago when Teal and I sat down and said we wanted to research something and try to recover some information about this topic. It's tough when you research, you want to limit your variables. Obviously, there's people in this room that have been in that situation, and you want to try to get something that's accurate or as accurate as possible. And so when we looked, we were doing some searches and pulling some articles. We looked at Fort Hood because Fort Hood is in Texas, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar or remember, but there was a shooting in 2009, then there was another mass shooting in 2014. And we were like, wow, there's been two mass shootings in the same exact place, which is an army base. And so, how were these, both of these events reported similarly or differently? 
And so that's kind of what we looked at. So when we were looking at the people responsible, you can just look and see that they're both in their 30s. One was in 2009, one was in 2014. And their names obviously will create some separation right away. But if you look at some headlines that we pulled, we're making religious reference to one person. And then the next person, we are more worried about his mental health, or he was called rather a gunman, and there wasn't much, we don't really care if he went to church, we don't know if he went to church, but it's not really an issue for us because ethnicity-wise, there's a vast difference here. So the headlines were kind of feeding into what we thought we would find. And again, we looked at mainstream sources. We looked at CNN, NBC, ABC. We looked at the most mainstream, most read or watched news sources. And then here, journalists will try to recover information. I mean, journalists investigate, right? So they'll ask friends and family, they'll ask people questions that they think is relevant to try to find out more information to share with the public. And they're really doing a great job here of asking specific questions, but very differently, if you notice on the screen. It's, we're trying to figure out why they're asking things about this person's religious beliefs and where their, their family lives. And then this person over here, if they were on medication. Well, here's the interesting thing about this research. Both men were being treated for PTSD. Both men were on medication. Both men did not want to be deployed. So they were both, they had the exact same motives. At the end of the day, they had the exact same motives. They did not, they were anti-military, and they were doing something outrageous and ridiculous and unthinkable to try to accomplish that message. But it's being re reported quite differently. And here, on one side, again, we're trying to see what kind of ties this person has to overseas uh, groups and possible other threats. And this other guy, we're like, well, we don't really care about his family or where he goes to church. We just want him to get treated for mental illness because that seems to be the issue. Um, and we're going to share with you guys a short video um, compilation. And what we want you to be looking um, at is how the stories are told differently. So I want to credit one of my really good friends, um, J.P. Carey with Wakayama Productions, because he put these together for us. But what we'll see is how these um, white male shooters' stories told through a series of clips. And then we'll look at how Muslim shooters are um, or what the narrative is there behind that. And then we'll look at the ramifications of that and what political leaders and people running for presidential office right now are saying about an entire group of people based on the actions of just a few. So if you just give me a moment to queue up the video here. 